Welcome. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today for a very special webinar um, that RDLA is hosting in a partnership with our Rare Artist Program at the Every Life Foundation. Share your story through art. I'm so excited to be joined by so many artists in the rare disease community, as well as some fellow staff members here at the Every Life Foundation and rare disease legislative advocates. Just some reminders for those participating in our webinar today. Uh, if you have any issues connecting to the internet, you can always join us uh, via uh, a phone, uh, very old school, but the phone number is there with the webinar ID. So you can join us if you're having any issues. Um, if you do have a question during the presentations, feel free to type them in the Q&A box and the RDLA team will either answer those uh, directly to you or pose the questions to our speakers. Um, and of course, we have closed captioning available. Um, all you need to do is click on live transcript at the bottom of your screen in the Zoom window, um, and uh, you'll be able to access the closed captioning. And at this time, I'd like to hand it over to Stephanie Rurden, our patient programs manager here at the Every Life Foundation, who manages uh, the Rare Artist Program, amongst many other programs here. So much, Shannon. Uh, thank you for having Rare Artists join RDLA today for this webinar. Uh, very, very excited to be here with many amazing artists to learn how to share your story through art. Uh, as Shannon said, my name is Stephanie. I am the Patient Programs Manager at the Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases. I have a rare disease myself, so very, very passionate about uh, Every Life. Um, my role entails managing the uh, Rare Artist Program, the Rare Is Scholarship, as well as the Rare Hub. Um, I am going to kind of be moderating our panel today and we'll be introducing our panelists in just a second. We have uh, six of them here that are absolutely incredible, all have different unique stories and um, art paths that they have gone down to share their story. And then from there, after our panelists give their introduction, we are going to kind of open the floor to allow all of you to ask some questions and the panelists will give some answers. Uh, and then we are going to allow you to have some one-on-one -on -one interaction with our panelists and we'll uh, let you attend some breakout sessions. We'll just sit back, we'll let the magic happen and um, send you into those breakout rooms. Then we'll come all back together for some closing remarks and some RDLA uh, updates after that. Um, but to get us started, I am pleased to introduce you to uh, Adair who is joining us all the way from Hawaii. Potentially. Adair, we can come back to you if it would be easier. Adair is having some technical difficulties. Um, Adair, we'll loop back to you. Ali, I am going to have you uh, introduce yourself. Sure, Stephanie. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome and thank you guys all for being here today. My name is Ali, as Stephanie just indicated. I am a 2021 Rare Artist Awardee. And just to give you some background about myself and my affiliation with the rare disease community, I was diagnosed with my rare disease called hypocomplement urticaria vasculitis in 2019. So it is a rare disease that's characterized by just recurring hives that can lead to severe allergic reactions, such as anaphylaxis, and it can also lead to major organ damage. I have had a very difficult time when it comes to from the diagnosis to treatment of my rare disease. And I leaned on art a lot to help me throughout those days when I did not feel my best. I do not have a background in art, but it was introduced to me by one of my mentors a few years ago. So art for me became a form of therapy. It has helped me on days when I have not felt my best. And as a result, it has helped me share my story. 
I painted the piece that you can see here. The piece is called Intensity. And I painted Intensity because I found it challenging to explain or to share with people what it felt like to live with a rare disease. Sometimes I felt like the words were not adequate enough to convey what I was going through. So sometimes having a visual representation can speak more than words can. And a lot of the times, especially with art, it has that unique ability to be able to evoke emotion. And it doesn't matter if someone has a rare disease or not, just by taking a look at the piece, they can be better able to even use their own experiences and empathize and kind of understand what it feels like to maybe be in your shoes for a little bit. I have used art to tell my story through my advocacy journey um, this year, especially during Rare Disease Week. And hopefully throughout this um, session today, I'll be able to share more information about that in terms of how I used it to talk with legislators and how I've used it in videos to share my story on social media as well. So I hope that thank you again for being here and I hope this session will be very insightful for you guys being here today. Amazing. Thanks so much, Ali. It looks like you got a special shout out in the chat as well from Jandra, who uh, inspired you to get involved with art. Thank you, Sandra. All right, Adair, I'm going to pass it back to you uh, if you are ready for your introduction. We have you on mute. Mahalo and thank you so very much. Aloha everybody. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I really, really appreciate it. Sorry a bit for the technical difficulties earlier today. Um, my name is Adair. I come from Hawaii. Um, it's a bit on the early side here. Sorry, again, technical difficulties. Um, oh my gosh. And uh, I have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome that is um, a connective tissue disorder. And I've got about 18 comorbidities. So my, uh, my disease likes to play hacky sack with my body. Um, I am a non-binary fine artist. I am a teacher and a public speaker. And um, I had the amazing honor in 2021 of being a rare artist awardee which was absolutely amazing. It got me into understanding um, work with advocacy, Everyday Life Foundation, Every Life Foundation, excuse me, and um, just this new road that I got to partake on uh, to use my voice, which has been really prominent lately. Um, I've been having a lot of hand issues and eye issues, and as both of these diminish, I'm finding that I have a lot of strength in my voice, and so I've been using that. Um, I also have a nonprofit called uh, Keep High Pie Art Foundation. We are an art school, and we're dedicated to inclusion and community support. Um, basically, what I uh, what I had the chance to do recently, working with uh, Everyday Every Life Foundation. Sorry, it's six a.m. here. Um, and the RDLA is I got the chance to talk to my representatives um, and senators from Hawaii about inclusion, um, specifically with the rare disease community. And um, out here, we're very rural, and a lot of that um, work goes very unanswered. Um, there's not... Um, there's a lot of things out here that need help, especially in the rare disease community. So it was wonderful to start those dialogues and to let them know that we exist. Um, so I am thrilled and honored to be here. I appreciate everyone taking time in their day to come out and to be a part of this global community with us because um, there is so much healing and the opportunity of self-understanding and growth that we have through art and also through the advocacy of our voice that I'm really excited to share that with you all. So Stephanie, again, mahalo and thank you so much. 
Thank you so much, Adair. Adair may be a familiar face to some of you all. Adair's uh, video was featured in the open mic for the Rare Report with Every Life uh, last month talking about the STAT Act. Okay, Elizabeth, I'm going to pass it to you for your introduction. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad to be here. And I love having met Stephanie so much. So um, I am, uh, my name's Elizabeth Jameson. I have multiple sclerosis. I have advanced MS. I'm a quadriplegic. And um, I, when I got diagnosed with MS, MS is diagnosed by most, in most, advanced countries by MRIs and MRIs are, as, as are used to track the pro progress of your disease. And I received my MRIs and they were frightening to me, absolutely frightening. They're the MRIs of the brain and the, le the MRIs track the lesions in the brain and I was scared to death and gross, lit, frankly grossed out because they're Halloween like images of the brain and I refused to look at them. And then I thought, shoot, I'm an artist. I have to do something about it. I have to take my eyes and take control over them and not leave it to the medical community or the, the technology, but to take ownership of my MRI. So I've been, my art career for the past five years has been delving into all my MRIs and making them beautiful, hopefully interesting, curious, and hopefully, um, I'm hoping to have people come away from my arm to notice the beauty of the brain. And I, and it's meant, it helps me to find myself as being beautiful, interesting, ugly, normal, boring, and a celebration of what it means to be human. So that's how I've used art. And uh, I, um, as my MS is advanced, I've lost the use of my hands. So I can't do art anymore. So now I'm a writer and I write about chronic illness and disability, again, from the, uh, from the perspective of it's, we're all human beings and there's joy and boringness and every other thing in the world. And that's how we survive and triumph if we can with our chronic illness, disabilities. Take pride. I try to be, try, take pride in my multiple sclerosis. That, that's what I, really would love to have people have more conversations about what it means to live in an imperfect body. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for sharing your story. Um, Elizabeth, some of her uh, MRI pictures are on the screen, but if you get a chance to look up uh, Elizabeth Jameson Fine Art, you'll be able to look at uh, more pictures of Elizabeth's MRIs and some images of other people's MRIs that she has turned into art as well. All right, Pendle. Hello, I hope you all can hear me. Can we can you hear me? Okay, good. Thank you. I needed the reassurance. <laughs> um, so my name is Kendall Grady. I'm a classically trained violinist. Um, I've been specializing in music for social change initiatives. When I was asked to do this panel um, and 
listening to all of your stories, um, I was excited and passionate and also intimidated. <laughs> um, and three questions have been popping up in my mind, which is the questions that I think kind of shape our mental framework around who we are and our place in the world, which is who are we, where have we been and where are we going? Um, and when we think about these questions, it helps identify ourselves in what we believe and ultimately what our purpose is. And I realized that words certainly um, can't identify everything that I am, which is probably why I'm a musician. <laughs> um, and I wanted to share then some meaningful projects that I've been a part of before I share my diagnosis, because for me, I'm trying to balance understanding who I am as a whole entity um, rather than just what I've been told I struggle with. Um, so one of the meaningful projects for me was producing um, the opening production of the International Women's Forum, celebrating women in powerful positions such as Hillary Clinton was a guest speaker at that. Um, I've recorded for uh, Grammy awarded CDs and the Sundance Film Festival. Um, I tend to, I love to tour. Um, I've toured with conductors from Broadway and the American Ballet Theater and the Hollywood Bowl. Um, very high profile people, which can be for me, um, again, scary when I think about who I am or what I'm dealing with, just like so many of you. Um, and as I was working in these contexts, I discovered that I loved pairing classical music with other art forms. So I started commissioning pieces um, about mental health and about preserving nature that incorporate architecture and ballet. Um, one of my probably most rewarding experiences was working on Easter Island. Um, I teach quite a lot and I developed a non-culturally appropriative crowdfunding campaign that awarded the music school 17,000 pounds, which in Chilean pesos was a big deal. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is that my musical journey keeps evolving past what I was trained to do in school um, and I have started developing my own pedagogy method and workarounds on the violin that helped me do what I do. But basically, um, when I was 21, I was diagnosed with a pituitary macroadenoma, which is a brain tumor that uh, produces hormones and affects hormone balance, as well as um, recently within the past year, EDS, uh, connective tissue disorder, as you've heard. And both cause a lot of challenges for me, fatigue, weakness, um, sublocation, uh, the dislocations of joints. Um, it, it's very difficult. And I find that wanting to take part in these high profile gigs or taking part in raising my own potential has me, you know, battling a lot of these symptoms. Um, and I guess I'm in the process of trying to work, balancing work and rest while I um, identify as somebody who lives with these struggles. So that's just a little about me in a nutshell. Um, I'm very grateful to be a part of this and to learn from you all. Um, and I'm also grateful to Winslow, who's the head of the, Winslow Dixon, she's the head of the Adrenal Alternatives Foundation. Um, and I have been on her basically artistic board, developing work for her as well. And that's how I got introduced to Stephanie. So I'm very grateful to be here. And um, thank you for having me. <laughs> much Kendall I think you made so many wonderful points of 
our art and our workarounds being so much more than our diagnosis, but also incorporating that into our identity and our own strengths, which we'll talk about more in uh, just a little bit. Uh, Pat, I'm going to pass it over to you. Hi guys. All right, my name's Pat Gare. Um, my wife actually is the one with uh, rare diseases and she's got RSD slash CRPS as well as systemic scleroderma. Uh, we're both artists, even though she hasn't worked much because of her diseases. I actually started in the rare community in 2016, basically. In 2013, I started a project called uh, 10,000 Hearts for Gina. And I started to paint, and still in the process, by the way, 10,000 12 inch by 12 inch hearts on canvas. And through this process in 2016, somebody notified me about the Rare Artist Contest, which I ended up becoming an awardee. Uh, it changed my life. I went to DC, sat through the conference, learned through all that whole week, the art show and everything else. That art has a huge, huge potential to change people's lives and views on rare diseases. So our concept was to go out and do public displays, art shows, we do music festivals and set up booths and whatnot to go out in the public and basically try to teach people about rare diseases. Through this, we've you know talked to doctors that don't know a lot about it. I've worked with people from several different rare disease communities other than my wife's. We've helped a lot of different uh, organizations raise funds. And we actually, after the uh, show in 2017 in DC, by the time I got home, I decided to start our nonprofit, which is Needing Hope. And what we do is we actually send these hearts out to patients and caregivers, just to give them a sense that they're not alone, there's hope, there's people always thinking about them and working behind the scenes. Uh, we also started a project called Rare Kids, Rare Artists, where we supply art sets to children that are dealing with rare diseases. So we've been working with the in and NIH. We work with a group out of Philadelphia, get stuff over to Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, as well as send them out to kids all over the country. And we just want to continue to push the fact that art really has a place in the rare disease realm. And it's such a great learning experience for people. And it's amazing when we do these public shows, hearts, a simple thing like a heart, how people come up and ask you, what's it about? Why hearts? And it's such a great introduction for us to go into and start explaining to people, not to mention meeting people with rare diseases. I've learned so much about other rare diseases through doing these shows. People come up and start talking to you. And it's just really an amazing experience. And I think that people really should explore this possibility, you know, for themselves, because really for me, doing the art is the most important thing. You know, it helps me survive all the, you know, trials and tribulations of dealing with my wife, but it also helps other people in the long run. So here we are today and hopefully we can help other people kind of explore possibilities and how to go forward and share your stories. I think it's really important. So much, Pat, and I commend you for all the work that you have done and using Rare Artists as, as your platform to start all of the amazing work that you've done with legislation and beyond. Thanks. Um, my last panelist I'm going to introduce is uh, Shayna. Oh, am I on? I can't see. Yep, you're up. Okay. Um, hey, y'all. I'm Shana Stern. Um, now I'm very intimidated myself to follow Pat with all that he's done. Um, I've had MS for 23 years and CRPS for five. I was never supposed to be an artist. I was a dancer my whole life, and that was my happy place. Um, I became a working screenwriter, but eventually my MS symptoms made it impossible to continue. And of course, it was right then when I fell and tore my ankle and had to have the first of seven foot surgeries in five years, which is how I got uh, CRPS. 
But so there I was like unable to write, unable to paint, and I was languishing. Um, I started playing around with my son's art supplies, but I have no feeling in this arm or hand from MS. So I kept dropping the brush and ruining it and it was super frustrating, but I had to create somehow. So I ended up teaching myself how to paint by creating my own method of painting where I sit on the floor, uh, balance the canvas on my legs, and I use my fingers and knuckles um, on top of, but also from underneath the canvas. And when I listen to music, I see fully choreographed and costumed dances. So I try to interpret that onto the canvas. Um, so each piece that I paint is done to a single song, which I listen to hundreds and hundreds of times. Uh, but when I am sitting on the ground, crouched over the canvas, covered in paint, that is the only time I can escape the nonstop pain from my CRPS and my MS symptoms. And I forget about the loss of who I was and what I did and my cognitive issues and the debilitating fatigue and my medical bills. And it's just me dancing through paint. And I am living proof that art therapy can change your life. Um, I also use photos of myself to try to bring awareness of what it's like to live with rare diseases. Um, I found that if I can capture a concept in a photo, it will make more people stop and pay attention, uh, especially if it's something that evokes a strong emotion in them. And when they pay attention, they listen, and that's what we need, right? Um, so I try to come up with creative ideas of photos and, uh, and I write an essay with it and I try to use humor and um, my skills as a wordsmith um, to make an impact. So that's my story. Amazing. Thanks so much. Shana, do you uh, mind if I mention your, I know you just talked about your photographs. Do you mind if I mention your photograph that's shown up here? Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, this photograph that you see on the right of your screen, um, Shana was organizing her medical bills one day, uh, wasn't even planning to take a photo of this, but actually posted all the medical bills on the wall. Um, and so this kind of really shows, and I know every life has done a lot about like the burden of, of living with a rare disease. Uh, so thank you for being able to show that and portray that in, in an artful way in an image um, was really empower, empowering for me to see. And, and I sent it to multiple people, which was a big reason why we were like, oh, she needs to be on this panel. So excited to have you here. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, it's, this is amazing. Wonderful. So before I let everybody go to their breakout sessions, um, I want to make sure that our audience gets a chance to interact with you all and ask some questions. If you don't get a chance to ask a question during this, we'll probably have about five to seven minutes for Q&A. Um, if you don't get a chance to ask a question during this Q&A session, please make sure you do so uh, during your breakout room. But if you have a question, feel free to type it in the chat. It could be geared towards any of our panelists. It can be uh, geared towards all of them, but um, please feel free to ask any questions that are, you know, what do you want to know more about our artists? Do you want to know more advice on what they have for advocating for their rare disease through art? Um, the floor is yours, whatever you all would like to ask. So we'll let people type in the chat box for just a minute. And then as we start getting questions in, um, I will read them aloud. And then panelists, if there's one that stands out to you that you want to answer, um, feel free to just say so. Um, I'll ask one to get us started. Um, it's a question that, you know, leading rare artists, we we get a lot of questions. If you, if you were newly diagnosed, and Ali, you might be a great person to answer this, being newly diagnosed. Um, what do you have, what advice do you have for somebody who is newly diagnosed in the rare disease community and enjoys art? Sure, I'll be happy to answer that question. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, I am new to the rare disease community and I'm also new to my advocacy journey as well. So for someone who has been newly diagnosed, I would definitely say to 
keep doing art because as Stephanie mentioned, it is already something that you enjoy. Use art to be able to help you throughout your rare disease journey, um, especially on those days when you may not feel your best. It can be used to talk about the things that you're having difficulty with. And it can also be used for things that are empowering. When I look at my art pieces, I feel like they are a part of me. They kind of tell my story in a way that I cannot just do on my own. So I would say for anybody who's new, just use it to, for any day, just experiment with it. It's not really about the end result for me. It's more about the process and how I feel while I am creating the art piece. That is what has been more important for me. It's just how do I feel, how it's calming and therapeutic for me, more about what does it really say at the end of the day. And um, I saw that Chandra uh, wrote um, that she is a, a retired teacher and she was wondering even if she hasn't had a background in doing art, um, would art be a good idea for her? And um, everybody, everybody should do art, all kinds of art. Um, if you think back to when you were five years old and we all did, we, we took our crayons and our watercolors and anything we could get our hands on and we just let our imaginations go and we created and we created and we played, right? We had that absolute joy and that undulation of playing. Um, when I teach, I try to get all my students back to that place, being five years old and just playing, just enjoying color and movement of their hands and expressiveness because living with uh, rare diseases can be exhausting, intimidating, um, intense, right? And art of all kinds gives you an expression, gives you a way to kind of relieve that, that pressure valve and kind of let some of that out. And um, to kind of take the, the scariness away and just play with it, have fun, make a mess. Don't worry about what it's gonna look like. Just go full hog and throw everything at it and have fun. That's what I would say for that. Yeah, so thank you, Shauna. Okay. May, I, may I add yeah. something to this? Um, yeah, absolutely. My mentor in art school was, his Bible was turn the music up really loud, take a big paintbrush and dance. And we don't care what the product result, but just dance like crazy and turn it louder and louder and just release it just, and you know, that's how I learned how to paint. Cause I love being an artist, but I don't find it. I have a lot of, I, I think I'm a perfectionist and it's hard for me to get out of my perfectionist body and not be critical of myself. But boy, when I turn music up loud and I'm just dancing, flinging paint, it's great. Great, great answer. That sounds like a lot of fun too. Um, one question, oh, Pat, go ahead. I was just gonna say on, on this whole concept, as an artist, they often say that it's not the final product, it's the action of making the product that's the most important. So for anybody who thinks, oh, I'm not an artist or I can't be an artist, I can't do something, just go do it. It's not about being perfect or having the best art on the wall. It's about really exploring your inner self. In a lot of cases, it's about just like people say, you forget about all the realities of life and just disappear into it. And it's amazing how it can relieve so much in your life, even if it's just for a short period of time. So don't be afraid to go out and pick something up, a crayon or a pencil or whatever, and start doing it or write or sing. You know, there's so many different ways to go about it. That's awesome. Thanks so much. I want to get to the, uh, the next question. This is one that we hear pretty often with rare artists and every life being an advocacy organization. How do you find is the best way to turn your art or storytelling into awareness and action? 
It's a great question, Tasha. Um, well, if no one's going to speak, I, I, I can talk on this a little bit. Um, making connections with other organizations uh, and groups. So right now you have an amazing in with your rare disease group, be that on Facebook, be it on other social media. Um, that gives you a huge group of people that are already invested in you and what you do. And um, those are the best people to connect with right off the bat, is to put your art out, your story out to uh, the population that understands you the best. And then from there, what I found is other nonprofit organizations or other um, art centers that are local. And then I'll start kind of branching out and letting them know who I am, what I'm doing, um, what my rare disease is, how I'm trying to impact the community, help the community, um, get my art out there to tell a story, right? And um, what I found is often I'll um, send my images, I'll write a little letter, and then I'll walk in at some point so they can put a face to the letter. And I find that to be really, really helpful. But again, your community is one of your biggest strengths, I'd say. Great point. Um, actually, your point that you made about the Facebook groups is great. I've, I've found that there are rare diseases that have art specific Facebook groups. So for example, there is an ataxia art group on Facebook. If there isn't one for your rare disease, feel free to start one. There are a lot of people interested in the ataxia one. For example, there are people who didn't have an interest in art. They joined this group and now they're creating things. Um, I am going to ask one more question uh, just because we want to get to the breakout activity. Um, Tara said, a part of me wants to be an advocate with art and the other part of me is afraid to make my diagnosis a part of my art. It feels so vulnerable to be open to the public about it. What advice do you have for me? Um, I felt like I could speak a little to this because I still struggle with this today. Um, what I was trying to get at in my introduction was the fact that, at least in my field, um, there is the fear of opening up and saying that you're struggling with anything. It could be fatigue, it could be a scheduling issue, it could be anything. And the fear of being blacklisted, basically somebody saying, oh, um, you know, she's not cut out for this. Um, I, it happens a lot. Um, and it, I, I've been told it to my face, um, especially for females. And what I started feeling in myself was that I was hitting a precipice between what I wanted to share, what was inside me and what I thought was being accepted by the world. And I had a decision to make, and I still do, I, every time this moment hits, it's a decision of, am I living my life authentically? And what does that mean for me? And authentically today could mean, you know, that I feel good and that I'm, I'm ready to play and um, I'm looking forward to it. And then authentically a few hours from now could be, I'm really hurting and I need five minutes to uh, get a snack or to sit down or to lie down or drink a glass of water. So. Um, I just wanted to say that I completely understand um, that I hear you and I feel the same way. And I would ask yourself at some point, which can be a very hard question, what is authentic to you and what would that look like living authentically? Um, and if that means using your art um, to describe or to get through the struggles that you face and that's beautiful and sometimes it might mean that you just use your art in your personal moments alone at home and that doesn't make it any less valuable or any less special um, you can be advocating for yourself to the spiritual wor world <laughs> so I just wanted to say um, that I'm sorry you're struggling with this and and I understand <laughs> good luck
Thank you all for joining. I hope everybody enjoyed their breakout session, getting to um, meet each other, meet the panelists, and get a chance to really reflect on um, how they can share their story through art, whether that is creating that strength shield just as a start or really understanding the power of art. I know our group had a pretty deep conversation about that. I just want to remind you all, art take time, takes time. I know we had a very short breakout session. I feel like we could spend all day here together talking and sharing stories. Um, a lot of you had questions. We will send a follow-up email to make sure that all your questions are um, answered. And um, if you want to connect with any of the panelists, feel free to reach out. Um, but just a reminder, Rare Artists does open for submissions June 1st through July 15th. You do not have to have experience as an artist. This is a way for you to share your story through art. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach me at any time. It's why I'm here at rareartists at everylifefoundation.org. And I am uh, very thankful for you all to join us today, but I'm going to pass it back to, to Shannon. Great, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, I just have a couple of updates from RDLA. We have our monthly webinar coming up on April 21st at noon Eastern Standard Time. Um, we have our monthly webinars. They're a great way to keep um, updated on what's happening in Congress and other uh, federal policy issues that impact the rare disease community. We're going to concentrate this April on the appropriations process and some of the priorities for the rare disease community um, with appropriations. And then um, I'm really excited um, that Rare Across America uh, registration will be opening in early May. This is a great opportunity to meet with your federal legislators um, in the district and state offices. Um, and so we'll have more information on uh, registration and what that's going to look like this year um, in light of COVID. Um, and, <laughs> and so, um, you can check out our website, rareacrossamerica.org for updates on that. Well, thank you all. We will have the recording available. And like I said, we'll get those uh, answers to you right away, but enjoy the rest of your day. Don't hesitate to reach out to Rare Artists or RDLA if you have any questions, but enjoy the rest of your day.